will now give you my sermon. I thought it was finished a couple days ago, but as some of you heard, we had five and a half hours on the bus waiting for a replacement in Rock Creek, and uh, I had plenty of time to look it over and scratch out things and add a couple words here and there, so I think this is the final draft, at least for today it is. Today, I am a climate change warrior. I'm a Unitarian. I am a seeker of the way. Who are you? Some of you have identified as Unitarian for a long time. Some are new to this combination of ancient denomination and modern movement. Some may be floating in newfound freedom. We come together in mutual support to share our joys, our sorrows, our questions, and occasionally our answers. You will change and grow as a congregation. You are a home for many personal traditions which will clash and blend, constantly living and constantly dying like any organism. You will become a village, a shelter, a sanctuary, but you will also be a force for good. Nelson and the Slocan Valley are better because you are here. This watershed, with its own interdependent web of living and dying, will grow in health and well-being because you are here. You are a home within a friendly universe, a universe which is grateful and loving to every cell of your existence. You are welcomed and welcoming. We love you and I thank you for considering my good news. I want to tell you first about a few moments in my spiritual journey. I was born in 1945. I grew up in the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Detroit, Michigan, but for my first decade its name was Church of Our Father. And if Our Father resonates with some of you, as in, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You will recall that Unitarians have loved the historical Jesus and sought to rescue his teaching from institutional Christianity since the 1500s. One of our Sunday school texts in the 50s was Jesus the Carpenter's Son. The historical Jesus was raised by ordinary people like you and me, Joseph and Mary. In Sunday school, we learned love and respect, giving and receiving respect, but we also learned the wonder of science. We learned the scientific story of the universe. We learned the basic value of each person. Everyone has a story. Only much later did I learn that humanity is not the pinnacle of material existence. But this was the 50s, when humanism was waxing strong in the Unitarian spectrum of belief. This was before the ecological view, when meditation, Zen, and Tibetan Buddhism were virtually unknown. The seminal book, Silent Spring, written by Unitarian Rachel Carson, had yet to be written. And our seven principles had yet to be dreamed of. In fact, our seventh principle wasn't voted in till 1984. It states, we covenant to affirm and promote the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. I, w I wish now to jump to 1965. I was visiting my home church with my Unitarian mother we had a book table during the coffee hour after church, and I bought a slender translation of an ancient Chinese text, the Tao Te Ching. Tao means the path or the way. Te means power, and Ching means text or book. So Tao Te Ching means the book of the path or the way and its power. This is a strangely modern little book from five centuries before the Common Era. The Tao Te Ching starts with its most difficult verse. Here it is. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. 
The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you only see the manifestations. Yet mystery and manifestations arise from the same source. This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness. The gateway to all understanding. Unquote. What this means to me is that human brains from infancy are biased towards discriminating things, naming things, defining what things are and are not. But in the process of acquiring language or naming, we learn to ignore relationships. The interdependent holistic systems which keep things humming along. We are born into a cultural worldview which is like a magnifying glass with blinders. And yet, we can choose to wake up. Here's a quote from Leonard Cohen, which applies very much to me. My mind was always very cluttered, so I took great pains to simplify my environment. Because if my environment were half as cluttered as my mind, I wouldn't be able to make it from room to room. <laughs> Here in Nelson, in this watershed, you have the opportunity to participate in this amazing beauty. To open up to it with all your senses, as Henry David Thoreau did. Call it the interdependent web of all existence. Call it Gaia. Call it the unnameable. For any name would create boundaries within it, around it. Divinity is a verb, and I, uh, to paraphrase Philip Hewitt, divinity is a verb. I call it the Tao, the way, and I am both seeker and the one sought. Call it the wild, in Thoreau's sense, when he wrote in his essay, Walking, all good things are wild and free, and in wildness is the preservation of the world. Now, I have my arguments with Thoreau, but then all we have are his 19th century words. And as the Tao Te Ching says, in all humility, the person who speaks doesn't know, and the person who knows doesn't speak. <laughs> That's about halfway through the book, before it speaks on and on and on, with more paradoxical nonsense that I love. Why do I love it? It knocks me out of my smug worldview. Which brings me to my next example of change in relativity, slavery, and those who fought against it, <coughs> the abolitionists, the anti-slavery warriors. I started this talk by saying I am a climate change warrior. Specifically, I'm willing to put my body on the line to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion but my commitment started in 1993, when I read Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance, which was about climate change. It broke my heart. But 1993 was also the summer I heard Joanna Macy, the Buddhist environmental activist. In 1993, I heard 12-year-old Severin Suzuki's speech at the UN Environment Conference in Rio de Janeiro. I remember she said, you grown-ups, if you can't fix it, please stop breaking it. <laughs> that was 1993. She's now on the board of the David Suzuki Foundation and studying Haida language at UBC. I, in 1993, I went to Clackwood Sound and to jail to stop the destruction of old growth rainforest. In 1993, my 60s Unitarian immersion in nonviolent direct action in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement came to my rescue. My heart was broken, but I found a way to heal it. I made a vow to my son. I only told him later, but this is what I said in 1993. 
I will do everything in my power, everything in my power, to prevent your premature death at age 66 in 2050 from the collapse of civilization caused by climate change. And in 2030, when I am 85, I will say to him, I did my best. That's all we can ask of anyone. We do our best. Humbly, we do our best. But how? How do we stop the burning of fossil fuels? A few years ago, I read Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. She concludes by asking, when has a moral force defeated an economic success? And she comes up with one example, slavery. Specifically, the slavery which led to the US Civil War. And who mounted that moral force? It was a small minority of abolitionists, mostly Quakers, including the Quaker Unitarian suffragette Susan B. Anthony. These abolitionists endured violent opposition as well as gradualist moderation. But they eventually convinced enough Northerners that slavery was simply wrong. It took a civil war, but slavery was outlawed long after it was outlawed peacefully in the British Empire. Today, our moral force is fighting another economic success the fossil fuel corporations. Today, those of us committed to the Coast Protectors Pledge, signed by over 23,000 people, will do our best to stop the Kinder Morgan expansion, which, if built, would produce greenhouse gases equivalent to at least 20 million additional cars on the road every day. Canada is far from achieving Harper's paltry greenhouse gas goals, adopted by Trudeau as our inadequate Paris Agreement goals. But expanding the tar sands, the nation's biggest source of greenhouse gases, would be game over for the climate, according to NASA scientist James Hansen. So how does our ethical opposition to fossil fuels and economic success parallel the abolitionist ethical opposition to slavery? In their day, they were considered crazy radicals for opposing what was economically expedient, the reduction of human beings to the status of furniture. Listen to this quote from an early field ecologist, Aldo Leopold, who wrote The Land Ethic in 1948. When godlike Odysseus, Ulysses, Returned from the wars in Troy, he hanged all on one rope a dozen slave girls, whom he suspected of misbehavior during his absence. This hanging involved no question of propriety. The girls were property. The disposable of property was then, as now, a matter of expediency, not of right and wrong. Concepts of right and wrong were not lacking from Odysseus's Greece, Witness the fidelity of his wife through the long years before at last his black proud galleys clove the wine dark seas for home. The ethical structure of that day covered wives, but had not yet been extended to human chattels. During the 3,000 years which have since elapsed, ethical criteria have been extended to many fields of conduct with corresponding shrinkages in those judged by expediency only. He continues, the first ethics dealt with the relation between individuals. The Ten Commandments is an example. Later accretions dealt with the relation between the individual and society. The Golden Rule tries to integrate the individual to society democracy to integrate social organization to the individual. There is as yet no ethic dealing with man's relation with human beings, relation to land, and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. 
Land, like Odysseus's slave girls, is still property. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges, but not obligations. The extension of ethics to this third element is, in human environment is, if I read the evidence correctly, an evolutionary possibility and an economic necessity. Later in this 1948 essay, Leopold outlines what he means by a land ethic. First, he says, all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instincts prompt him to compete for his place in that community, but his ethics prompt him to cooperate. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. I think of the Lubicon Cree First Nation in the middle of the tar sands, which once was a productive boreal forest, and now it's a stinking toxic mess. Although Leopold continues to define the land ethic in terms of right and wrong. Quit thinking of decent land use as solely an economic problem. Examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of nature. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So back to the 1800s, Imagine you are a young Susan B. Anthony, back in the early 1800s. Your Quaker family has been kicked out of the local friends meeting because they are too radical in terms of abolishing slavery. They find a welcome at the Rochester, New York Unitarian Church, but few Unitarians are opposed to immediate abolition of slavery, although many are for gradual emancipation. Susan learns that white married women and slaves have much in common. <laughs> Neither are persons before the law. Slaves must endure cruel masters, and abused women cannot divorce without losing their property and their children. Susan decides that she will not marry and lose her legal rights as an independent person. She decides to work for slaves' rights, and then in 1848, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, for women's rights. She works for women's suffrage into her 80s, and finally, long after her death, women in the states get the vote. My point is that, as Martin Luther King said, quoting abolitionist Unitarian Theodore Parker, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We are again at such a point in history. The David Suzuki Foundation's Blue Dot campaign aims to enshrine the right to a healthy environment in the Canadian Constitution. And UBC law professor David Boyd has published a book on the rights of nature Quote, in some countries, endangered species have a legal right to exist, unlike the southern resident killer whale population, which is down to 76 in the Salish Sea. We have very weak uh, laws protecting species in Canada. But going on with this quote, I'll start again. In some countries, endangered species have a legal right to exist. And if you think that is far-fetched, consider that New Zealand has granted legal recognition as persons to both the Wanganui River and the Te Uriwera region, previously a national park. So the time has come for us to consider moving outside our comfort zones, a little or a lot. I respect everyone's need for balance in their lives. Indeed, without balance, you won't be very effective. But if you do decide to slow down climate change, for example, 
Don't do it alone. Reducing greenhouse gases is a difficult, long-term problem with unfortunate urgency. It can be daunting. But if you form an environment team here in your congregation, you will find some enjoyable projects that may be good for the climate. Back in 1993, when I decided to become a climate change warrior, I didn't know where to go with my volunteer energy. I could have gone to the science-oriented David Suzuki Foundation office in, in Vancouver. But as Einstein said, religion without science is blind. Science without religion is lame. So I decided that I needed to balance the coldness of science with the warmth of music and the arts and spirituality. So I joined the environment team of the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. And the balance of science, arts, spirituality, study, team spirit, and fun has been perfect for me. Every April, we put on an Earth Day worship service and invite our friends. It's a wonderful time of celebration because we do have a lot to celebrate. Just a couple weeks ago, uh, we helped First Nations who are fighting the fish farms that are destroying the uh, wild salmon in the Bergen <coughs> Archipelago. They raised $8,500 at our church. So, we have a lot to celebrate. The second part of my vow to my son is, I will stand before you in 2030, and I will say, I did my best. That's all we could ask. So, let's do our best together. And now it's feedback time. So, uh, if you have... Uh, Questions or comments? We have time for uh, who knows two or three uh, comments. I'll just uh, introduce this part. I've been inspired by Unitarian and Quaker abolitionists and the many Unitarians active in the civil rights and peace movements. Now our struggle is with the Kinder Morgan pipeline and the expansion of the tar sands. What do you think about what we've been talking about? What I've been talking about? Go ahead. That's, he, he's number one. Anyone else raise their hand? You're two, and then somebody else. Number three, I'll give you a number. Go ahead. I was just wondering, how do you deal with our Prime Minister after so many promises and such a change, and or do we just wait to the next election and hope to boot him out with some kind of Proportional representation eventually. Yeah, yes. proportional representation would be really nice, wouldn't it? Uh, and that may happen in this province. Um, there, there's. Uh, I, I was saying to someone before the service uh, two things that that Trudeau said during the campaign. One was that he didn't want the Northern Gateway pipeline to Kitimat, but he did want the Kinder Morgan pipeline. He also said. Uh, Governments grant permits, yet ultimately only communities grant permission. And we have City of Burnaby, City of Vancouver, and some other municipalities, as well as the First Nations that are on the pipeline saying, all these communities are saying, no, we don't want it. So he's, he's put his foot in it. Um, and so, um, What's happening next Saturday is the beginning of a huge movement uh, which will hopefully stop Kinder Morgan or delay it because the investors get really nervous when delays happen that aren't predictable. And if the investors pull out, then it's over. So every delay is a victory. So next Saturday, there will be uh, the Slave Tooth First Nation who live right across from the Marine Terminal where the tankers get loaded. They are building a uh, watch house to watch over some operations. It's confidential, I can't tell you exactly where, but um, we expect uh, up to 100 First Nations leaders from across the country, certainly from all over BC, First Nations chiefs and matriarchs, and uh, 1,000 or more than 1,000 individuals, like you and me, coming to the SkyTrain station, and we will be marching 
to the site of the uh, construction of the watch house. It's in pieces, so all required is putting the pieces together. And then a man from the Slaywood Tooth First Nation will be living there for quite a while. So uh, I've, I've volunteered to help with waste management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who's number two? Number two, yeah. Thank you, Carl. Um, first of all, it's really nice having a sermon today. Um, rather, um, I really like your style of sermon and talk. And um, so I was curious about the Earth Charter and how that relates to um, it. Is it a thing these days? Because it was a thing for a while. And does it relate at all to Canada? Like, the UBC professor wrote about ethics, but are they related at all? Yeah, unfortunately, the Earth Charter didn't have the force of law, and so it, it can be ignored. Um, yeah, I remember a few years ago when different groups and individuals were asked to sign on, right. and it was uh, quite, quite a meaningful document, mm -hmm. but its time has passed, apparently. Okay, so... Uh, I think, I think there needs to be uh, something like the Earth Charter, perhaps briefer. Um, I think the, uh, the pledge, the Coast Protectors Pledge that I mentioned, was written by um, uh, Grand Chief uh, Stuart Phillip, the head of the UBC, Union of BC Indian Chiefs. And if I can recall it, it says, on the land or the sea, we will do whatever it takes to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline. That's basically what it says, to stop the expansion. I really liked your 20 billion car thing. That was... Yeah, <laughs> 20, million. 20, 20 million cars. That's a minimum estimate, because I've also heard of an estimate with, with um, sequelae of, of the pipeline construction, 35 million cars. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, so at least 20 million cars, additional cars that aren't there now would be uh, fueled by this, uh, this extra pipeline. And, and, you know, the funny thing is, it's, it, the price of oil is, is not uh, worth digging that stuff out of the ground. I mean, they're losing money for every barrel that they send to California. And right now, instead of five tankers a month, which it used to be, it's one tanker a month. And so, and eight, you know, China doesn't want it either. They're going to electric vehicles. So, um, Kinder Morgan, unfortunately, they win either way. Even if there's no oil going through their pipelines, they have contracts with oil producers that they have to pay, even if they don't use the pipeline. So, Kinder Morgan would would win economically, even with an empty pipeline. One more, yeah. I think we'll stop up there because we've got other things to go I, on to. I have I have two things. Yeah. One, um, the 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 notion of a covenant with the earth, uh, a legal covenant mm -hmm. with the earth. Uh, Ecuador has um, legally, <laughs> you know, a law that the that the earth is. Um, takes precedence mm -hmm. um, over over everything. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, people are legally required to protect the earth. Mm -hmm. And um, if Ecuador can do it, um, I'm sure that that's something that we as a people can uh, support mm -hmm. and make happen. I, I think it's a really important piece. I know that when when they were redistricting British Columbia, or even and and changing the boundaries of this and that to al allocate uh, members in the legislature, when they came here uh, and they were trying to do it on the basis of population, um, they were eliminating. They were planning to eliminate a number of the MLAs. Uh, particularly in rural areas, because that would just make them having to cut cover a, a more massive amount of ground. And I said to the commissioners, 
somebody has to speak for the land. You know, it's not just a question of population and people. It's a question of speaking for the land and for the earth. And maybe we can't do that until we have a covenant that says we have to. And I really thank you for that. Um, the other thing I want to say is I didn't have the camera on when we sang the Fire of Commitment. And I would really like us to, to sing that again so that it's on camera. Up to you. Nope. It'll have to be the, after the closing. We'll, we'll do it after. So if, if anyone, I'll, we'll be staying for as long as Marcia and Dale stay. <laughs> and if any of you want to talk about uh, Kinder Morgan, and um, I, I know it's not near uh, Nelson, but climate change is everywhere. So <laughs> if you want to talk about that, I'll be happy to stay around and do that. This, your generous offerings. Yeah. We accept your generous offerings in the spirit of commitment that it be put to a befitting use that is in the best harmony with our seven principles. And now we're going to do a little piano piece. We're going to actually repractice a song that we were working on last week. So we wanna, this is uh, actually the number 1017. It's called Building a New Lake. It's in this book, the second First to the last song. First last week. And uh, we're just going to play it again. The words are simple. I don't really have all the words. Uh, Can we stand? <laughs> yeah, please stand. Uh,
So that's that's standing. in the uh, order yeah. of service. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back page. Back page. No. Yeah, it's it's uh, in yeah on the back page of the order of service. So not sing the first verse. No, sing it all. You can sing, I'll it, sing all. it all. Okay. okay. From the light of days remember Burns a beacon bright and clear Guiding hands and hearts and spirits Into faith set free from fear Council of Canadians chapter met and decided to hold a rally here in Nelson next Saturday at noon in support of the uh, protecttheinlet.ca uh, action beginning on Burnaby Mountain and we believe that this is only just the beginning of a, a, a really powerful movement that will stop uh, the expansion of this pipeline. And we, uh, so it's at noon next Saturday, March 10th, and we're meeting on Baker Street in front of Waits News at Ward Street. Great. In front of what? I received these um, um, called Just News, the history of Canadian Unitarians for social justice in the mail. So I'd like to pass them out to everyone. Everyone take a, take a copy. And uh, right after our service today, we're having a potluck lunch. So we hope everybody will stay for it. Do we have any others who 
Any other announcements? So next week, I don't actually have the title, but there will be next week. <laughs> yeah. the, do you know the title? No. Not quite yet. No. I'm not quite ready for that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be the speaker next week, but uh, I've been called away to be a living legend or a living library for the BC Teachers Federation uh, next weekend. So, um, Ali Gom, uh, I'm going to do some work this week on the sermon, and Ali Gom is going to deliver it. And now it's, it's time to, don't sit down, it's time to <laughs> suspend this chalice flame for another period, for another time. As we suspend until next, the child's flame, think of it as the symbol of the life force in each of us. And now we'd like to join hands, stand and join hands and sing carry the flame. Most of us know it, but we'll take it away. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. <laughs> So, so nobody really talked about how they thought about the sermon. Oh, good. I'm glad you came. I think it'd be good to get a more of a No, we're going to just stay on Baker Street. All right. The week's best. There's more people there. It's a on Baker Street. Yeah. Yeah. Ward. Good. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's right there. Yeah. Right by John Ward Cross. Send you a yeah. 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 We did it there once before. We did it there. Was, we had a rally there about a year and a half ago. A rally about the Kinder Morgan Pipeline. Uh, just before Trudeau announced the decision to go ahead. And, so we're just, and it was very successful. We had about 70 people there. And, yeah, no, and it worked well. So we'll do it again. Yeah. And what's part? That was thanks to you. We got it. We we're kind of late to the party, but we'll get the notice out. Unfortunately, there weren't very many unitary ministers of that era who were abolitionists. In fact, the Fugitive Slave Law was signed into law by the President Miller Fillmore, who was a unitarian. And there were oh, give me a hug. I'm not well. I'm not going to catch it. I've already had whatever. I don't catch it. I'm well, but I'm not well. Okay, well, one of one of the. The, the Lake Maganti uh, explosion was uh, a product from North Dakota back in the oil fields uh, in the fracking oil. And uh, that's highly explosive. So uh, Bilbit is not explosive. But Bilbit is diluted vitamin. What if you don't uh, put the dilute? <laughs> dilute and just nap to us? Right? Oh, I can. Right. 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 So, so in terms of skill, there's a lot less based on the land and the ocean. Or the ocean. I don't know if those are not so much. Still, still, 